Hey everybody, welcome to the Elseworlds Exchange. I am Sal and I'm joined today by Garth Ennis. Garth, thanks so much for being here, man. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to join you. Uh, I'm very excited because we're here mainly to talk about your, uh, I don't even know if it's the most recent work because you're so prolific. You've been working for you mm. know, 30 plus years. Uh, but uh, TKO Productions has this book called Sarah. It's awesome. Uh, I read both volumes in one sitting. <laughs> It was easy to do, uh, and it's a terrific story. Not much of a departure from your wheelhouse. It's a, it's a war story. Uh, mm. Actually, Garth, do you want to sell it? Like, you want to talk about like what Sarah is and where they can find it and all that stuff? Sure. Uh, Sarah is the story of a Russian woman sniper uh, during the siege of Leningrad at the end of 1942. Uh, the Germans have invaded Russia. They've surrounded and laid siege to the city of Leningrad. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are starving and dying. Um, the Russians are fighting back slowly, steadily. Uh, Sarah's a sniper. It's her job to go out and kill the enemy. Um, she's part of a seven woman team, essentially. Um, Team is perhaps a misnomer. They, they tend to fight in twos, one shooter, one spotter. Sarah's unlike the others in that she fights alone. She goes hunting alone. Uh, but occasionally the seven of them uh, find themselves in the front line alongside other soldiers, men and women. Um, and uh, as, the, as the story progresses, you get to see Sarah do her thing. You also start to understand that if fighting for a to one totalitarian system, communism against another, fascism has its own set of contradictions and complications. And uh, Sarah has a couple of things in her past that um, make it slightly worse for her even than the others. Uh, so you've worked with uh, the the artist on this book is Steve Dep Steve Epting, uh, whom <laughs> everyone right. is familiar with, of course, from his Winter Soldier work and so much more. Um, what brought Epting to the project? Um, TKO found him, actually. Uh, Sei Chun and uh, Sebastian Garner told me that uh, he was interested. I knew his work. I wasn't overly familiar with it just because he's, he, he tends to work on superhero stories. Uh, but I could tell from just looking at his work that he was a tremendous artist. Of course, there's always the question when you're working with someone you've never worked with before, will you click? It's like yeah. any relationship, really. Um, will he get the scripts? Will he see what I'm going for? Will he veer off course? Steve was perfect from the first panel on the first page. He absolutely nailed it. Uh, after a while, I was so surprised at how close he was to what I wanted <clears throat> to the point where uh, it almost seemed as if he was looking in my head, which is the stench you get from all the best artists that I started to wait for him to go wrong in a weird way. I, I kept <laughs> thinking, well, he can't be this good. He can't be this spot on. He's got to eventually veer off course. Not once. Uh, six episodes, 20 pages each, the entire thing. He nailed it, plus yeah. the covers. So um, honestly, if, it, if it's not the best artwork that's ever been done on one of my stories, it's damn close. Yeah. I, I think I agree. And I was going to say, you tend to work with uh, with folks you've worked with before. It's right. interesting to see this combination. Yeah. And damn, if it isn't a lethal one. Uh, I yeah. loved this series. And I was just so engrossed. And you could feel you could feel the Ennis in there. But it had this very different quality. It just felt like a totally different thing. Despite the fact that if you're a fan of Garth Ennis, you've probably read everything. And you are so immersed in like the war story mm -hmm. um, such a different story just off the top of my head i just was curious how much of sarah and her platoon or her cadre of soldiers is rooted in real life versus just something you thought was a cool idea yeah the actual characters themselves are invented as individuals they're all completely invented mm -hmm. um the historical truth is that Russia put many, many thousands of women into the front line as combat troops, um, and many hundreds of them were snipers. Uh, some of them were extremely effective. Uh, one woman killed over 300 people, I think. Um, however, the characters in Sarah are not meant to represent any one or any one individual or any group of people. 
Um, they're invented randomly. There's the squad leader, there's the squad nutcase, there's the rookie, there's Sarah herself, who's um, probably the best shot and the best sniper, but not the most forthcoming of personalities because of the <laughs> thing that's happened in her past. Yeah. Um, if you if you're interested in this, if you go online and you Google Russian woman sniper, you should come up with uh, a photograph. Eventually, a photograph which is um, titled something like "775 Kills in One Picture," and there are twelve woman snipers. Um, they look as if they range in age from, say, their late teens to their maybe mid thirties, although one girl looks as if she's about 12. She just has one of those young faces. Yeah. Um, their uniforms are covered in medals. They're all smiling. They're all carrying their rifles. And between the 12 of them, they're supposed to have killed 775 people. Wow. Now, if you look at that photo, which I did, I took some of the faces and kind of imagined them as characters. That doesn't mean that I was trying to bring those people to life. I was just, taking the faces and imagining what they might be like. So uh, one woman has a, a very, as I say, there's there's the incredibly young looking one. Then there's another woman who looks as if she's gotten a bit of a taste for it. Mm -hmm. Then there's, uh, there's another one who looks like a, a very sort of keen, cheerful, bubbly individual. Um, so although I was, again, I must emphasize, I was not trying to bring the, the woman from the photographs to life. I was just using them as visual starting points uh, for some of the characters. And if you look really closely, you'll be able to see them. Uh, Sarah herself was completely invented, though she appears in no photograph. Um, but sometimes you see that. Sometimes you'll just see an image and it'll give you an idea for a character and you'll run from there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now you've talked about um, your career over the period of time and you've talked about like your inspirations and stuff like that. It's amazing how a photo or a song lyric will trigger mm -hmm. an entire story yes, and, and make you go in places that that source never intended or never could have could have imagined or conceived of. Yeah, she's um, quite right. It, it can be a turn of phrase. Um, if you go all the way back to Preacher, um, the sin of killers, his name at least uh, came from a lyric in a Pogue song. Um, I think the line, I can't remember the name of the song, but the line goes, there ain't no saint just for killers. And I think I, I imagined, well, what if there was? <laughs> but it's what you're saying, you know, it's, it's just a phrase, it's a line, it's, it's a scrap of, of language. Yeah. And sometimes you can, you can get a hell of a lot out of it. Definitely. I mean, yeah, we, you got an entire, uh, you know, one of the most uh, influential series of the 90s, I would say, out of that, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting how, um, you know, you've, you, 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 this is a war story. Sarah is a war story, or rather it's a character study, you know, set against the framework of a war story. Um, you tend to, at least from my POV, uh, talk more about from the Western side, mm -hmm. uh, what made you go? Let's talk about the Russians. Let's cut, let's let's get it. Let's approach it from that perspective. Mm. Um, I have written about the, the Russians before. I, I did a series uh, called "The Night Witches," um, which was serialized in in the Battlefield series. And here and there, I have touched on the Russian front, uh, either from the Russian or the German perspective. Yeah. It comes from having read quite a bit about it as a kid. One of the war comics I read was, uh, was a story called Johnny Red. Um, that's, that's, it has been reprinted um, sort of in fits and starts, but that was set on the Russian front, and I was reading that when I was eight or nine, and it really opened my eyes to a side of the Second World War that growing up in the West, had previously had no knowledge of whatsoever. I'm, I'm sure, like yourself, we're, we're essentially taught that the war was won by the Americans and the British. And first of all, we finished off the Germans and then we took care of the Japanese and that was that. Right. Um, what we're not told is that the Russians did 90% of the work and took 90% of the casualties. In fact, yeah. probably more while they were at it, that it, it was the communist juggernaut breaking the back of the fascist one that allowed victory in World War II at all. Um, so it's an, to answer your question, it's inevitable that I'm going to veer to the East 
from time to time. Um, as I said, there was the Night Witches series. Very, some of the German stories I've done have been set on the Russian front, like Johann's Tiger, um, The Last German Winter. Um, Sarah really came about because I like writing woman characters. I like writing about the, uh, the woman who saw action in World War II on the Soviet side, because really no one else is telling their story. Right. Um, and there are more to come. You know, I'm, I'm always going to be uh, writing about that particular topic. But in this instance, the, the, the notion of a woman sniper story, just, it was really just the one that was ready to go when TKO asked me what I'd like to do and told me they'd publish, you know, anything that, that I wanted to do, essentially. Okay, because that was going to be my next question was, what, what, what attracted you to TKO? What, what came first, chicken or the egg, where you're like, I got this, I got this story about Sarah, I really want to tell it, who's going to, who's going to help me tell that story? Yeah. Um, um, but, uh, but yeah, so TKO came to you, and they were like, what you got? They did, yeah. Um, part of it, uh, I, I've known Sebastian Garner, uh, who's the uh, sort of editor at TKO. I've known him for a long time. He used to work at Marvel, and he, he lives near, uh, quite near. And uh, he and I have always had an interest um, in that part of World War II anyway. Um, uh, Sebastian's actually German by birth. He lives in the States now, but uh, he knows quite a bit about that, that particular bit of history. And uh, I suppose just because it, it was one of the many things that we talked about in the pub over the years that when, when he came calling, when he and uh, say Chun of TKO came calling, it, it seemed like an obvious fit. You know, why don't I do one of these things I've always talked about, you know, that we've always been, been interested in. Uh, it, like I say, it just seemed like a natural fit. Do you, um, since you've worked in comics, you've worked for British comics, you worked for American comics, mm -hmm. uh, the format is what I'm really getting at. And it's like, yeah. do you care about the size, the format, the, the shape, uh, the presentation, uh, in, in as much as like the way the TKO presents it, it's in an oversized format, the way that they sell it. Like, is that kind of interesting to you or do you kind of just like, just let me tell the story and, and, and you guys handle the, the, mer the, the marketing of it? Um, Cause it's kind of interesting. Extent, I do tend to leave that, that end of things to the publisher, but in this instance, um, I think, I think there is something about that oversized format that gives the artwork that, that epic widescreen quality. Yeah. Um, I think also the fact that they were publishing the thing all in one go like that, so you could read it in six parts or you could read it all in one go. That appealed to me very much because um, that's how I write anyway. I write each story in one go intended to be read in one go. And yeah. so the fact that they were making that an option for the reader from the get go rather than serialized followed by, by a trade collection. Sure. That just made so much more sense to me. It's such a good fit. When I was uh, when I got back into comics, I was a, when I was a kid. I read comics, and then I kind of fell off when the '90s kind of like when the bottom fell out. I was like, I can't mm -hmm. do this anymore. Um, I missed a lot of great stuff, including mm -hmm. Preacher. And when mm -hmm. I got into college, my uh, a friend of mine was like, "You got to read this." I read the first volume, and it, the shock of it, you know, I'd never seen anything like it before. Mm -hmm. And my like, you know, early Christian sensibilities when I was growing up just completely, you know, created this barrier, had to shatter through it. And when you get through it, you get this like beautiful kind of like love story. And I couldn't wait for the next volume. And thankfully, because uh, I had gotten to it late, the whole thing was done by the time mm -hmm. I get into it. Which is when, the best way to read it. That's exactly right. And now my question is, when you does that apply? Were, were you kind of like, did you know where Preacher was going to go? Did you have it all kind of done when you uh, started? Preacher was really where I learned to do that. Um, because when, when I began it, it was just one more monthly book. Steve Dillon and I were thinking, well, they've told us they'll take any creator-owned book office because Hell Blizzard had worked out so well. So here's our shot. But did we think it would survive? Well, we hoped. Did we think it would become a huge, or the hit of, of the magnitude that it did? Um, no, we didn't have a clue. I always used to say that its, its success didn't surprise me, but at the same time, if it had crashed and burned, I wouldn't have been surprised either. The point is, it was just impossible to tell. Sure. But what Preacher taught me was, <clears throat> 
think of the whole story. Don't think of it as a book that might or might not succeed. Don't just leap into the unknown with your fingers crossed, which is what I did to do to an extent with Preacher. Think about the whole thing. Think about the five years, the entire saga. Instead on Preacher, because as I say, it's a learning experience, what, what happens is that around about the middle to end of the second year, I figure out how it ends. Uh, and I start to see that this is how I this is how I, I have to treat this thing. Um, I suppose what I'm thinking in in terms of are what people like um, Alan Moore did on Swamp Thing, where yeah. he just takes over this this book that this sort of almost afterthought of a book that DC published where the sales are not doing terribly well, and everyone's thinking, well, roll the dice on this. Maybe this English guy can turn this into something. If not, what the hell, cancel it and start exactly. it. Exactly. Instead, he turns it into this magnificent epic. Um, and you've got three or four years now collected as the 40 or 50 issues. You've got this thing that's kind of a benchmark for longer stories, long form stories and comics. So that was, that was the, that, and I suppose maybe something like Sandman, those were the kind of things that were, that had shown the way. Um, you also had, for instance, Grant Morrison working on Animal Man and Doom Patrol, Pete Milligan on Shade, Jamie Delano on Hellbiz. So the idea was to come along and do three or four years and build something. Um, so that was, that, that was sort of the guiding light in a way. Of course, you don't know that it's going to succeed. No. But once you get into the rhythm of it and you, you, you start to think beginning, middle, end, and you're especially thinking about the conclusion, um, that I think is the lesson I learned on Preacher. And that's the lesson I applied to basically everything I did from then on. Mm. It's, I, I just, uh, I love how that series uh, seems to have this kind of like other life to it where it, it goes in a direction. It's clearly going in a, in a direction. But mm -hmm. and, and in, in terms of some of the work that I that I that I adore of yours, uh, you like to do this thing, and I found it's not present in Sarah. But I think because Sarah only has six issues, but like you you like to do this thing where and and I want to kind of talk about that a little bit. The idea where you go in this direction and we're heading to there and we're going a million miles per hour, and then you take a little little detour, mm -hmm. take a little break, take a little breath, where we check in on characters that are not the main characters. Mm -hmm. And kind of like see what they're doing, and, just, and literally, it almost might, it might not even have any bearing on what the main story is going to be yeah. or where we're going. But you just go, but what are they up to? And almost like a kind of like I know you really want to see the end, but I'm going to tease you a little bit. Is that is that kind of the approach, or is it? Or is you, it you do you know? I myself do like to catch up with characters. Do like to check in with them and see how they're doing. If I strand some poor sod on a beach counting sand for you know, two years or whatever it is. I do want to see what eventually happens to him. Likewise, the idiot in the desert uh, building the giant or digging the giant message to, to be visible from space. Yeah. I do want to check in with those people. There's an element, I suppose, of uh, as you get near the end of the story, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. I, as you say, on something like Sarah and my more recent work, no, it's not as necessary because you're you're driven by a shorter narrative and maybe a punchier narrative too where you've you're uh, you're going in a definite direction and you don't want anything getting in your way yeah yeah um you have mentioned this before the idea of uh revisiting characters and stuff like that um is there anything you've done in your career or that you're that people are more familiar with that uh that you are like i never really got a chance to go back and say something else about this character or that character is there anybody you'd like to go back and kind of go like let me let me i got something else to say about them um i i do find myself returning to the the supporting characters from hitman yeah. um i did the six pack series the or six pack dog welder and i did section eight I do like the idea of just dropping into Noonan's bar now and again and seeing <laughs> how people are doing. Yeah. Um, Beator in particular, the, the sort of jabbering demon barman thing. Right. Quite fond of him. So not impossible. I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't drop in on him again at some point. 
beyond that, it, it's sort of a, a thing here and a thing there. I did a series a couple of years ago called Johnny Red. I wouldn't mind doing a bit of that. Uh, another one of those, maybe just to finish that story out. Sure. Um, and uh, one, one I did recently, that's a sort of example of what you're talking about. About 20 years ago, I did a, a war story called Archangel about a British fighter pilot who was cursed by bad luck. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd always intended to do more with him. Uh, his name's Jamie McKenzie. And just last year, I was able, uh, able to put out a book called Out of the Blue, uh, in which we catch up with Jamie and find out whether or not his fortunes improved. They didn't, really. They didn't. <laughs> of course. But uh, that, was, that was nice, being able to put that book out. In fact, I think a collection of it's just about to come, come out. Oh, great. I, I think. Um, and finish off his story, uh, just for that sense of completeness, just to be able to say, remember that guy? Well, here's what happened to him. Yeah. You know, uh, so that... So that, that uh, that thread isn't left dangling, I suppose. Right. We have, uh, I, I've heard you described as having a problem or rather a, a lack of affinity for superheroes. And mm -hmm. it's been talked to death. I don't want to hash yeah. on that subject. But um, I, I find that that seems to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like that's people putting words in your mouth about how you, like, it's, it's a catchy, sexy headline. Garth Ennis hates superheroes. Mm -hmm. But you've done a significant portion of superheroes in your, in your time, and you've had, it seems to be, an earnest approach to them. Confederate, confederacy of dunces aside. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's a series that I just wanted to touch on, just because I have you here. Thor mm. Vikings. Oh, yeah, right. Where did that come from? And, and, and was it just you going like, yeah, I'll take Thor. I'll do that. Like, <laughs> I think it was, at the time, I was doing quite a bit of work for Marvel. Yeah. Um, and I'd done the Punisher series with Steve Dillon that had worked out quite well. And the Nick Fury book with Derek Robertson, which is still one of my favorites. Such a good book. And um, I think, I think it might've been as simple as walking. I was living in New York at that point, just walking down the street and thinking zombie Vikings, of course. <laughs> zombie Vikings. Um, the thing I, I do remember at that time, that um, people were getting upset, e even some people at Marvel were getting upset about the way I was treating their characters, mm -hmm. uh, the guest stars in The Punisher and so on. Um, and I got the same response for Thor. The thing was that, uh, because Thor does get a, a bit of a rough time in that. Sure, story. but, yeah. the, but the, thing, the thing about that is like, every hero has to go through yeah. a rough time. Like you have to put them through the ringer or exactly. they can't succeed. And, and that's exactly. the thing, even with, uh, what was it? Um, your Spider-Man series, like he takes his lumps, but he does succeed at the end. You know, it's, it doesn't seem to be, it's not mean spirited is what I'm trying to get at. You yeah. know, I mean, it often is mean spirited. It's just that in this particular instance, I wasn't being mean spirited. <laughs> I, was just, I was just doing that, that old thing you've talked about where the hero gets the living crap knocked out of him. Yeah. He may appear to have been killed just to emphasize how dangerous this particular foe is. Exactly. He comes back from it. That's all it was. I, I should say, though, that as for the notion of hating superheroes being mean-spirited, yeah, I mean, it's entirely justified. It really <laughs> is. Um, I, I, my main complaint is the way this single genre dominates the industry, dominates the medium. Mm -hmm. um, that's what upsets me about them. If if you had a more even-handed approach, um, rather than than having what ninety-five percent of the industry and in, uh, certainly in the West um, taken up with this one genre, exactly. Um, that obviously is where something like The Boys comes from. Yeah. Um, and taken from another point of view, the, the only way I was able to write The Punisher long term was to take all the superhero trappings out of the book. Right. Effectively to forget about the Marvel Universe and say there is the Punisher and there is Nick Fury too, because he fits that world quite well. Um, and otherwise say, no, this, this costume stuff has no place here. Right. And once you get rid of those trappings, of course, you're freed to do all kinds of stories that otherwise would be a problem in the Marvel Universe. Well, that seems to be Frank's whole problem 
from his inception. I mean, he first appears as a Spider-Man villain yeah. and then is transformed into his own anti-hero. But set against the Marvel Universe, he's entirely, in, he has to be ineffectual because right. he undermines what the heroes are doing. Right. Uh, and his whole approach is an- antithetical to the conceit, which is a revolving door of, of colorful characters. If Punisher right. had his druthers, he would just annihilate them all, which is, of course, where Punisher kills the Marvel Universe comes in. <laughs> Right, right, which is the, the one idea I had when they, they came to me all those years ago. <laughs> um, yeah, he doesn't fit. He really is an anachronism. I, I sometimes think of him as a, a British comic book character born on the wrong side of the Atlantic because he fits mm-hmm. far better into the, uh, the kinds of characters that, uh, that I grew up on in right. 2000 AD and so on, Judge Dredd being the most obvious one. Of course. Um, He's a, he's a better fit there. And that, I think, is because, of course, he, unlike most comic book characters, is born of film and TV and Pulp Fiction rather than other comics. Yeah. He's, he's a creation of the 70s. He's Dirty Harry. He's Mac Bolan. Um, he is that archetypal vigilante character. Right. Um, he, he belongs to that era, but he is not really of comics. He... He's almost, you would almost say he's a mistake. <laughs> but a very happy one from my point of view. Absolutely. No, yeah, your, your run is second to none. Uh, and the, the, the impact on your run and, and the legacy that is left, I think has completely, it, it's almost funny because now you can't do anything else with Castle that isn't that. And when you do, you have to go so far in the other direction. It's almost like we have to go back to making him like a Ghostbuster. Like we can't yeah. just uh, we can't just make him effective here in the Marvel Universe. You have to do something bigger. You have to turn him into a Ghost Rider. You gotta, right. you know, make put him in space. You know that kind of thing. Of course, of course, because he he does present a problem. He's he's a large recognizable trademark that never works for any length of time. Yeah, that defies attempts at adaptation. Um, that doesn't fit the ethos of the Marvel universe. And yet there he is. People like him. They like that big skull. Yep. What do we do with him? We've got to do something with him. So <laughs> let's just uh, let's just keep it throwing stuff at the wall and hope it sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was curious about uh, what you've written in the past that you think, because... I'm different than I was 20 years ago. I'm sure we all are. You wrote these stories. These stories are products of their time. They are snapshots of your POV of the yeah. world. Uh, is there anything that you would, you think you would write differently or you would want to write differently now in this scope of today? Or is that kind of derivative and it's like, no, let's write something new for today. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would mostly try to do new stories. Um, but it's an interesting question though. I mean, I, Rather than, than considering how I would write Preacher today, for instance, yeah. I would simply say I would not write Preacher today. Um, it's a creation of the 90s. It's a little more hopeful, a little more idealistic. Um, if you then flash forward about five or six years to The Boys, you see a far more cynical worldview, uh, a much more unpleasant way of looking at things. Um, a couple more years after that, I do Crossed, uh, crossed is pretty extreme stuff, pretty bloody. It's it's also a very bleak view of the world. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, the more the more I see of the world and the way it's going, and the more history I read, um, I sometimes think I didn't go far enough with crossed. But if we take it as an example, where I to write a new crossed story today, it might it might be less bloody and less action packed, but it would probably be darker and bleaker. Sure. Um, which reminds me, there is another cross story I've written that has to come out, but Avatar are sort of caught in some kind of publishing limbo at the minute. Hopefully it will one day see print, but where I'd write a completely new one starting today, it would be quite different in character. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as, as, but as you said at the start, it's, it's not really what would I do with this story today. It's I would do something different today. Sure. Yeah, because I don't, I don't think it, it's interesting because, of course, your work has been adapted. Um, and mm-hmm. congratulations. I'm sure it's, you know, 
I'm sure it's a feather in your cap. Uh, the Boys, incredible show. Uh, Preacher got an adaptation on something that isn't HBO, which kind of blew my mind. Right, um, right. I'm saying that. And, and imagining, I remember one of the biggest hurdles I assumed they would have was trying to make, because what are they going to do? Are they going to set Preacher in the 90s? Are they going to mm-hmm. make it updated for today? Right. Does Preacher work as an updated? thing for today can you have preacher in a day of in an age of cell phones and surveillance and mm-hmm. like instant information and stuff like that like and, mm-hmm. and i th- i think they walk the line pretty okay with that but you know doing something kind of of their own as opposed to just mm-hmm. doing a straight up adaptation um yeah but yeah how's it how's it feel to have uh, all these all these adaptations of your work and, and getting to see someone else's interpretation of what you've of what you've essentially well, it, said it is it is nice i, I certainly can't deny it i mean um, this has made my life uh, much easier. Uh, it's enabled me to relax a bit, take a step back. And it, it that in fact, more than anything else, is what has led to uh, work like Sarah, Johnny Red, Out of the Blue, a recent book called The String Bags. It, it gives me the time and the financial freedom to work on things that are closer to my heart, but aren't necessarily commercially overwhelmingly successful right. each of them i find does well enough for me to do more good uh in fact i'm working on a, a few new things right now that will be very much in that vein uh but that's what what uh tv and so on has meant to me more than anything else mm. uh just being able to relax a bit and, and think a little bit more about what it is i'm doing and what i want to do i hear you um the uh there's an interesting uh trend in today's world of if they were to have have adapted preacher 25 years ago Mm -hmm. i don't think you would have come out as a head as you might have today and same with the boys same with anything um Mm -hmm. and this and create our own projects of course thanks to the image revolution and 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 the proliferation of independent comics and Mm -hmm. creators rights um you know you probably see more financially from a personal project you made and you like self produced as opposed to something you made for hire working for one of the big two. Mm -hmm. Um, It's interesting today in this world where like, you know, anything is possible. It seems Mm -hmm. to be able to make a new thing or a, an adaptation of your work and and to make it more true to what you wanted or what you were going to do. You know, if, if, if Hollywood was going to make a movie of, anything that you've made over the last 30 years uh, back when the superhero genre was just getting rolling, it would be very different. I think a different animal. They want to put their spin on it as opposed to now where they're like, Oh, I'll put an author. I, I, it's more authentic. If I make it more like what it was supposed to be from the comic. Mm-hmm. Um, um, very, okay. very possibly. Uh, I mean, uh, when I think, I, I do think that, and this is slightly off the subject here, but I, I do think that perhaps my generation of writers and artists were, we were quite lucky. We hit a sort of a sweet spot uh, where thanks to the hard work of the people who'd come before us and their refusal to be exploited any further, we find ourselves reaping the benefits um, of uh, what people like Alan Moore and Frank Miller had done where they dug their heels in and said, no, we're not going to be treated like that anymore. Um, And we find ourselves, uh, people like myself, um, I suppose Neil Gaiman, uh, Grant Morrison, and so on. we found ourselves uh, getting offered deals that gave us a good deal more freedom, not just creative, but in terms of the actual ownership and control of the material. Um, and I get the sense that in the last 10 years, that has started to contract a little mm. and people aren't getting those deals anymore. Um uh, as if the the companies involved had said, uh, "Well, hang on a minute. Why are we giving all these people all these rights?" Right. And so it was very fortunate for us to have hit that particular sweet spot, as I've described it. Um, of course, today, uh, if you take the other approach, if you take the image approach, that can pay off handsomely. Of course. But uh, you know, of course, not every book can be a saga or a Walking Dead. So you you do have to you do have to sort of balance that out you have to ask yourself well do i need a page rate to live on but in terms of control of the material um perhaps there aren't as many golden opportunities as there were 
I, I do know that um, in terms of the actual production of the material, uh, page rates and royalty payments are not what they used to be. And really? people are having to get by on less, yeah, to, to an extent that um, when I've heard from people along these lines uh, has actually quite surprised me quite a bit. Hmm. I think that's probably absolutely a, 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 an astute observation is that they're like, wait a minute. <laughs> what if yeah. we change the narrative and turn the rhetoric into something more like you're lucky to work for comics and you're lucky to get right, anything exactly. as opposed to, cause yeah, they, I mean, I remember the marketing for, for the, you know, the suite of vertigo books that came out at the time right. and how it was like, it was hinged. It wasn't about Sandman. It was about Neil Gaiman's Sandman and it wasn't right, preacher. Exactly. It was Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon's preacher, right. you know, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, or they might say, for instance, what if, what if from now on we started promoting these projects as capital letters Batman books and yeah. not name of writer, name of artist? I mean, you're still going to see a few big names being promoted. Of course. But I, I think, I suspect, especially at DC, you are going to see um, a lot more care taken over uh, over those books as as the corporate properties mm. that are owned by that company yeah. rather than as expressions of creativity by um, Scott Snyder, Brian Nazarello, Tom King, people of like course. that. Have you seen um, how much of your work does, do you have control over for the stuff you produced for Vertigo? Um, you mean in terms of what happens to it? Yeah, like if if uh, if they wanted to put Jesse Custer on the Suicide Squad, um, I don't believe they could do that. Um, it's worth noting that most of what I did for Vertigo, I now have back. Really? Yeah. Um, Preacher is the exception. They're obviously hanging on to Preacher because that you know that does well for everybody. Exactly. <laughs> but they weren't too worried about letting me take war stories to avatar for instance uh sure. or pride and joy or adventures in the rifle brigade to image mm -hmm. um really and i'm not sure this this may be something a lot of people don't know but um as i understand it the the creator owned contracts that we signed at dc um allow them to keep publishing so long as they keep the thing in print and after a certain point, if it goes out of print, you you can get it back. So I, as I say, I'm not sure how many people are aware of that, but once I found out, I just uh, wrote to them and triggered the mechanism that allowed me to get back war stories, pride and joy, all the rest of these yeah. things. Um, to answer your question, if they were to suddenly put Jesse Custer in the, uh, the Suicide Squad or whatever, well, no, I don't think they could do that. But what that might come down to is, well, we've done it to us. Um, and so that, I suppose, would depend on the ongoing goodwill of the people at DC. I, I think it's highly unlikely that you'd ever see anything like that. Mm -hmm. But in brutally realistic terms, if there was a change of regime at DC and they started some sort of take no prisoners approach, Mm. It might be a question of good luck suing us. You know, right. good luck suing the gigantic corporation with the enormous team of lawyers. Yeah. Now, um, switching gears, but remaining in the wheelhouse of talking about these giant mega conglomerates that, uh, you know, could destroy us. Um, they, they created this new thing, Black Label. Right. Uh, any, any interest? I'm surprised there isn't a, a, a Garth Ennis Black Label, like Etrigan story or something like that. Oh, I see. Um... Well, I, I have no immediate plans. I mean, I am in touch with people at DC. Um, uh, Marie Javens is an old friend of mine. And so long as she's there, you know, I'll always entertain possibilities. Sure. Um, it, it, it comes down to really a question of how much time do I want to spend on work for hire? Mm. And yes, I, I mentioned earlier that it would be fun to revisit Noonan's Bar, something like that. Beyond that... Um, no immediate plan. So, so long as there are people that will um, allow me the freedom to do these war books, right? I can continue to, to uh, work on the, the material I have such a passion for. 
then not really necessary. But so long as someone like Marie is there, I'll always entertain ideas from DC. So long as my friend Nick Lowe is working at Marvel, I'll always go back and write The Punisher. Yay. (laughs) And we keep getting Fury stories maybe once in a while. Although, you know, maybe not so much anymore. I think, uh, I don't think, I don't think Nick's around. Nick, Fury or Lowe? Oh, Fury. No, no, Nick Lowe's still there. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, they both have the same name. That's <laughs> sorry about that. No, I I can tell you that you might see um you there there is a Punisher book that was kind of suspended when the COVID nineteen pandemic hit. Mm. Where you, you might see uh a few flashbacks to the Fury series I did a few years ago with Goran Parlov. Oh, cool. Uh, I mean that Nick Fury, that particular incarnation of Nick Fury, what you, you might say Nick Fury in the real world, the way I write Frank Castle in the real world in The Punisher. Yeah. Uh, that's one that's always going to appeal to me as well. Uh, yeah. Characters like that, where you can, you can, as we said earlier, jettison the superhero backdrop and just write real world stories. Um, th- they really are a godsend. I suppose the, the one DC would have is John Constantine. Mm-hmm. To an extent. I mean, he does have the focus focus, but... Well, he's been, he's been particularly saturated i mean he's got animated movies where he and batman mm-hmm. are bumping shoulders he's on every i mean although i don't know if you've read the uh the most recent uh i think it's the simon spurrier series it's pretty mm-hmm. it's pretty solid and it pays a very loving tribute to not only your run but also of course like you know the, the those who came before and after uh, yeah i've read some of Sai stuff and it is indeed good stuff yeah i mean they they brought out um they brought out a collection of my hell blazers yeah, uh, a few months ago, I would love to see them do the same for Jamie Delano mm. because his run—he was the original Hellboy's yeah. writer. His run, I think, was something special, and it was one that he set the tone for the book. Right, uh, and it, it was the one that I always looked back to. That, and of course, Alan's original work creating the character. Right. Uh, it's it's interesting um, getting back to Sarah and kind of put bookending everything. Uh, mm-hmm. There seems to be, you know, when you do superhero stuff or you do mainstream comic book stuff, uh, there is, I don't know, there's there's this element of kind of like lightheartedness within the narrative, even if it's, you know, graphically violent or, you know, horrifically cynical or, you know, mm-hmm. just this kind of like crack mirror version of, of everything. And But when it comes to a war story, it gets very grounded. It gets very straightforward. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it seems that there is a reverence for the war story from you. Mm-hmm. Um, is that accurate? Is that an accurate observation or is that just a... I think it know, is, well, a way, with, a, with the caveat that I would say that there is always or nearly always some degree of humor in those stories. Um, I mentioned Out of the Blue. That's, yeah. uh, that's a bit more lighthearted than Sarah. Uh, really because of the nature of the narrative and the character and their obvious fate. Even in Sarah, there is a little humor. Um, instances of it are few and far between. But for instance, there's her friend, uh, the, the squad psycho I described earlier, uh, makes a joke about um, having to eat the squad cat for dinner. Yes which leads into an even darker remark about what might be going in the pot just down the road in Leningrad, which if you know the history of that particular siege, that, that's yeah. an allusion to something downright horrifying. Sure. Um, but yes, I mean, Sarah is, it's a much darker story by its very nature because you've got a woman trapped uh, between the two totalitarian states that one of which she fights for, one of which she fights against, but she is, absolutely at their mercy yeah um it's you might say that it's actually in combat that she finds the most freedom absolutely because she's got a rifle in her hand and she can maybe use up whatever ire has built up (laughs) in her against her enemies Uh, although that that doesn't mean that they're necessarily the people she would like to shoot the most right but put a rifle in her hand and Sarah is certainly a holy terror. She has, um, <laughs> she has plenty to drive her along that path. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, Sarah is, it's interesting for me. I felt such a connection with her. She has this kind of like, when she's interacting with everyone around her, she seems kind of like dead inside. 
but it's just like it's more like she's a caged animal like she's kind of trapped in herself because she can't express herself in any and she's just surrounded by like this horrible cynicism and and and, and hypocrisy it's very if you're like if, if you are too plugged in to the world around you today i could see you seeing a connection with sarah because she it, it, there seems to be a kind of parallel between then and now in terms of like she's told one thing she's shown another she mm. is given power but knows she doesn't have any and it's it, it's this incredible i don't know i feel like there's a parallel between then and now in terms of like feeling trapped in a world that is lying to you <laughs> yeah i mean i, I th- there's also the the point that she herself unlike any of the other characters has has found out the absolute truth by accident, she overhears a conversation towards the end of the, the book. She, she, it's recounted in flashback. Yeah. And she's found out the absolute truth about their situation. And these are things that maybe a couple of her smarter friends might suspect. They don't know the details, but they might suspect the broad strokes. But Sarah gets it all in one awful go. Yeah. Um, and in fact, when, when she tells her friends what's happened, and she tells her friends what, what she's heard... Um, they're so shaken and shocked and scared that they don't even want to touch her. Right. It's as if she suddenly become she's suddenly carrying some infection. Or yeah. She has this terrible knowledge, and that I think more than anything else is what makes that character a loner. It's what renders her a solo act. It's what it would mean. It would mean it's what means she's always going to be alone. Right. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I, uh, if, if you haven't already checked it out, you should. It's an incredible series, uh, and it's true to form. It's the it's the kind of excellence that uh, the name Garth Ennis commands at this point. Um, there's there's a loving amount of like it. It's also interesting because you, there's there's not a lot. You know, there's a lot kind of packed into a small package. It's small amount of mm. of, of, of of. It's not a it's not a big commitment to read, no. and yet. Uh, I'll, I'll, I, I think if you pick it up, you'll find yourself rereading it because you'll, find, you'll pick up on different elements and different little pieces of information. And of course, hopefully, because like, I know you're a history buff and I know that like, you know, it, it helps to, <laughs> to know a little bit about the background. Um, it may take you on, uh, on a journey. You know, you might, uh, you might go out and Google the Russian female sniper image and, and, and search more about that because it's, Fa- it's genuinely fascinating. I was just like, oh, I I didn't even know that they did that. Like that there were female oh yeah, platoons in, you know, Soviet Russia that were do like since specific like it was specifically a female centric platoon. They have a female commanding officer. Like it's really cool stuff. Just a it's genuinely not, cool uh, look. It's it's not really so much that that they are a female centric unit. I mean they're they are It happens to be, but it's not yeah, they're they're snipers. You also meet male snipers in the story and i think that there are probably about two dozen in the unit all told it's just that the women have naturally gravitated towards one another right. they live in the same house it's made clear early on that uh, the commanding officer gave them a house to themselves mm-hmm. he makes he makes some remark about so you girls can have a measure of privacy because you are ultimately talking about the 1940s and even though it's a communist state where equality is supposed to rule men can't get over their natural conditioning Mm -hmm. so the women find themselves thrown together um but yes women were uh, i mentioned earlier they were put in the front line in all sorts of duties um as snipers as machine gunners medics they crewed tanks they crewed aircraft um they uh they fulfilled a, a large number of roles and that was that was partly due to the effect of um, uh, equality between the sexes being one of the hallmarks of the Marxist philosophy that formed the Soviet state. Right. It was also absolute necessity because in 1941, the Germans invade Russia. Millions of men are killed, wounded, or captured, or taken out of the fight, and someone's got to pick up a rifle. Exactly. And go in there, and uh, that's that's the job that these young women in their late teens and early twenties end up doing. So what's next? Because it's great, like you know, you, you talk about your favorite book of yours from nineteen ninety six. We're talking about your favorite book of yours from two thousand twenty. Like, hmm. just happy to see what's next from you. Yeah, well, there'll be uh, more of all the stuff that uh, that people seem to like. I mean, there will be more Punisher. I'm sure I'll gravitate towards 
some of the DC stuff at some point. Uh, there'll be more war books uh, that I'm bound to do another horror book at some point. Ooh. Yeah. I have to ask, just, just, just to satisfy an itch, if there were a superhero that you haven't tackled yet, that you're like, I think I could have some particular, mm-hmm. inst- like I, I have something to say about them, who would it be? Do you know, I, I don't, re- if I had a gun to my head, um, I'd, I'd probably do Batman just because here's this maniac dressed as a bat beating up poor people and the mentally ill. I mean, if you can't get some fun out of that. <laughs> I, yeah. I find that uh, folk like English, Irish uh, tend to have that perspective on Batman, that he's just, that the idea of a, of a vigilante being completely frightening. <laughs> like that it's this horrible idea of this really scary it's person. Also, that, um, there's also the fact that Dark Knight was the first American comic I ever read. Yeah. Um, I think I was about 16. So that was my first exposure to the concept, really. I mean, yeah. I was aware of them before that. Of course. That was the first thing I read cover to cover. Yeah. And that first Dark Knight book, that casts a long shadow. That's tremendous stuff. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, I think I read it when I was 13 and I was like, it, it shook my entire world <laughs> apart. Oh, to me, before that, Batman had just been the old TV show. That's it. The Adam West thing. Yeah. Um, and to see a, a sort of hardcore Pulp Fiction take on that was, it was an amazing thing to read. Yeah. And Miller doesn't pull any punches. Like he's, he is a, a psychopath, in a, <laughs> you know, in a, in a Halloween costume, was beating up mentally ill people. Like, oh, yeah. So, Good stuff. yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you guys next week with an all new episode. Uh, oh, Garth, where can people go to find more of your work or, or to find your insights into the world uh, at large? If there's if there is such a place, like is there a, a website they can go to or a you know? There is not. There is oh, no right. website. There is no social media presence. There is absolutely nothing. However, they can um, they can buy my books um, in the usual places, and of course, Sarah is available from TKO. Uh, string bags, which just came out, is available from Dead Reckoning, and Aftershock put out out of the blue. Yes, that's right. So check those out. Good for you, by the way, staying off that social media. It's a it's a it's a plague. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too good. It's really, really not good. So look, everybody.